shall we? I want to begin before we start on the traps and suffering. I want to pick up from a point I was started to make last week, and it'll kind of set us up for this week, if I may please. And I, um, kind of asked the question. When we experience the sadness, when we experience pain, we ex physical pain or mental anguish, if we experience an inability to manage our moods, you know, it seems like our life seems like a roller coaster of ups and downs, and uh, we're going through family issues that causes great pain. Um, does this mean? And I pose the question, does this mean that our depression or anxiety or fear is some sort of sin? Are we in sin? Uh, is that the sin? The depression, the anger, the fear? Well, not necessarily so. Certainly sadness or anger can flow out of some something we, we are uh, out of alignment with God's Word. That can certainly be true. But sometimes our suffering, our pain, physical, mental, however, wherever it's manifesting, can arise up in our life, can come up. We, be, we get ill. We get sick. Um, things, ex, external, ex, things that are external to, happen to us. And sometimes in dealing with that, um, we forget where to turn to for solace. We forget where to turn to for comfort. And we begin to look inward. Uh, we, we become sad or we become fearful or we begin to despair. And sometimes we begin to look inward for help rather than upward for help. And I've mentioned before, sometimes even our, our piety you know, we'll go, well, I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more, which is all good ideas, but we, we, we treat that as if it's a talisman. It's a good luck charm, our, our, our study habits or our prayer habits, instead of looking to the giver of the grace, uh, uh, Christ. Uh, Jeremiah, I love this little passage here in Jeremiah chapter 2. And then I'm going to read uh, uh, something else I've got here. But it says, Be appalled, this is Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning verses 12 and 13. Be appalled, O heavens, if this be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. Um, lots of great sermons have come out of that short little passage. And I remind us, you know, we tend to do that. We hew out these cisterns for ourselves, just like the, Israel, the, the nation of Israel did. We in our own life will hew out these cisterns, cisterns of water, wells of water, we'll hew them out. And then when we feel sad, we feel upset, we feel whatever, we're experiencing pain of some fashion. And we go to that cistern of water that cannot heal us. And instead, we need to turn around and look up to the Lord who is ready to heal us. We turn to the broken cistern inward to your, our own power instead of upward to Christ. Um, and we'll take off... No, I, I'll, let's get real with this metaphor of a, a cistern. We'll turn to comforts of this world to make us feel better sometimes. sometimes. I know I will. I'll turn to food. I'll turn to being lazy. I'll turn to sports. I'll turn to anything to, to keep from considering what I really need to be thinking about and repenting and turning to, Christ, to turning to the Lord to be healed, for the pain to go away, to be made feel, to help me feel better. I'll find some kind of creature comfort, something from this world instead of looking. Oh. Uh, there's, it's funny we mentioned this today, Voices from the Past. 
Um, a little section here. Uh, Thomas Case, an old dead guy. Um, and he writes, In our prosperity, we love earthly blessings and dote upon things in this world as if our happiness and comfort were bound up in them. In the day of adversity, God convinces us of our mistake and causes us to see the emptiness of this material world. It is a mere nothing. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We can see in affliction that the world is not what it seems, not what it promises, and not what we expected and flattered ourselves with. Hear this. Whatever a man makes his riches, whether friend, wealth, or earthly interests, they cannot deliver out of the hands of death and judgment. The soul finds by experience the unsuitableness and dissatisfaction in all these things. There is no comparison between an invisible soul and visible comforts, an immortal soul and perishing contentments, a spiritual being and an earthly portion. The air we breathe will as soon fill a hungry belly as creature comforts will satisfy the spirit. In the hour of trial, the soul says, Miserable comforters you all are. You are, no, you are physicians of no value. Ah, but there is infinite fullness in Jesus Christ. He is suited to all the needs of poor, undone sinners. No king was anointed with such power. No prophet with such wisdom. No priest with such grace. For God gave him the spirit without measure. And of his fullness we receive grace for grace. If we fill ourselves with the world, the less we will delight in Christ. This is our sin and our folly. Let me read those two sentences again. If we fill ourselves with the world, and the, the less we will delight in Christ. And this is our sin and our folly. But when God spreads sackcloth on the earthly, we discover the beauty of Christ and can taste His sweetness. He infinitely transcends all the beauty and glory of the world. He is our king to go, our prophet to teach, our priest to save. How precious. Give me Christ or I will die. We turn to these cisterns instead of Christ. There's traps out there. Here's my segue into the, into the day. We fall for these traps. Sometimes these traps are of our own construction. But there are traps in our suffering. And we've covered in the last few weeks now. Suffering is a fact of life. We shall suffer. Suffering is our, it's the uniquely Christian experience of sharing in Christ's suffering. It's going to happen. And we talked about afflictions, trials, tribulations, and all those. And, and, and then we've talked last week uh, of how we should not be surprised. It's a fallen world. Our bodies feel the effect of this being a fallen world. We age. We hurt, we ache. We suffer, right? And in our suffering, we can take comfort that Christ knows about. But being fallen and having minds that are fallen, we can often create traps that will lead us back to a cistern that is of no value to us. Bear with me while I find my notes. Here we go. So let's look at these traps some today. Hey, what do you say? Let's get smart. I think I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six traps that we need to be aware of. You know, if you know where a trap's at, you don't fall in it, probably. I might. But if we know where the traps are at, if we know what to be careful about. Forewarned is forearmed, right? So let's let's uh, let's look at these a little bit. The first trap I want to look at is the awareness trap. The awareness trap. Um, what verses did I put up there for that? Proverbs four twenty three, Mark seven fourteen, two twenty three, and Luke six. Let's look at those. 
Proverbs 4.23. Someone can someone get to that? Proverbs 4.23. Go ahead, man. Wash over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Okay. Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23, please. Someone. What defiles a person? And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defiles him. And when he said, when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it entered not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within you, from for from within, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, covering, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. That was the end, right? And Luke 6, verses 43 through 45. Some, please. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. We notice the common theme through those three passages being the heart. heart. Suffering is spiritual. There is, the, there is certainly a spiritual aspect to any suffering, even physical suffering. Suffering isn't just about our pain or loneliness or our sadness. It's about the spiritual warfare that is going on in our life at that time. We may indeed have great physical pain, but there is also at the same time what we need to be aware of the spiritual warfare that is also going on. What is going to win the battle for your heart? Are we going to turn to broken cisterns or are we going to turn to Christ for help while we endure the pain, whatever nature the pain is? We need to have awareness then of the trap that this is all about me or the awareness that of the trap that this is something other than it isn't. We need to be aware that Suffering is spiritual. There's a spiritual component to it. Desires form in our heart. We push our experiences through our heart. Uh, the Lord was teaching us. It's not just, though, it's not just about what we feel. It's also what we think about our suffering that matters. What are we thinking about our suffering? We need to remember it's spiritual. There's a spiritual component in all our suffering. Our suffering always has meaning. We don't suffer. The Lord will not allow, allow us to suffer unless there's meaning to it. There's always meaning in our suffering. And we need to remember that. It's easy to get caught up in the pain. I don't like pain. I, just, I don't like pain. Who does? But if we look to the fact that there's meaning in our suffering, it's not meaningless when we suffer. And if there's a battle going on for our heart, that's a little different, is it not? Um, what we make of our suffering, what do we allow the Lord to, to, to help us with in our suffering, has everything, says everything about what we value and what we'll get out of that suffering uh, in our life. So we must have a heightened awareness that our 
that what we think about our suffering uh, and what our thoughts are, they're a barometer of what's going on in our heart. We can begin to think, well, this isn't fair. Why me? God doesn't know. Sure, I'm being punished, which we know can't be true. We can bring all kinds of, well, we talked last week about incorrect theology uh, and what we bring into our suffering that affects it and takes our mind off of Christ and back to these hewn out cisterns. What we think about our suffering is a barometer for our, what's going on in our heart. We need to be aware of that. So that's the first trap, the awareness trap. Questions, thoughts, comments? It's kind of crazy to you. For me, when I suffer, I, I sometimes think, well, it's not that bad. I think there's God and there's Satan. Mm -hmm. Okay, the suffering is from suffering. Okay? And I think, I sort of think that it's God, I like to find out whatever Satan's trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. Always trying to analyze it on the margin of suffering. Is this a test of my faith? Possibly. Am I, uh, do I have faith in God or am I going up from some other resolution? Good, Sam. Kind of, Awareness. You're aware that there's, right away, you're, you, you see the spiritual aspect to all your suffering. Pain. It's welcome pain. Well, it's just pain. And we don't consider the spiritual part of physical pain. Tell me what to do. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, okay. The fear trap. Thanks, Sam. The fear trap. Let's look at two passages and compare them. Genesis. If someone would look up Genesis 22, this is a long passage, verses 1 through 9. And someone else... Well, I'll take 1 Samuel, because I'm going to summarize that one. I'll take the 1 Samuel passage. But if someone would read Genesis 22, 1 through 9, please. You read away. Yeah. Now it came about, as we said to the gods, as they said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, the only son, for you go to go to the land of Moab. And all of your hair is born off of me. I'm born of the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham wrote for early in the morning, and sat on his own, and took two of the young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he stood forth to run off of him, and wrote to come to the place in which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place of his son. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the coffee. I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship in each other. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering, and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took from his hand the fire and the light. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, the wood is a lamb, and the burnt offering. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the land of the Lord and myself. So the two of them will come together. Then they came to the place which God had told them, and Abraham built the altar there, and arranged the wood, found his son Isaac, and made him on the altar of the Lord. There you go. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So let's let's just look at this passage that we're all familiar here with with Abram. Um, imagine can you imagine is it possible that Abraham was afraid of what God is asking him to do was it, think he was afraid God has just said bring your son up here in this mountain and sacrifice him you think he was afraid sure you think it, but he was trusting God yeah. yes he was he wasn't going to allow his fear to deter him from being faithful. He trusted God. What would, what can you imagine he was afraid of? Losing his son forever. Losing his son. What was tied up in Isaac at that time? There was a promise that he would be the father of a great nation. 
My legacy is tied up with this kid right here. You've made all these promises, Lord. They all fall upon Isaac. And now you're at my legacy. All these promises are tied up. And now you're asking me to take him up on the hill and sacrifice him to you. I mean, I, we, we know elsewhere that he believed that even if he killed Isaac, that he would be brought back to life. Back to life. And in so, a sense, he was. So That's what is that faith? But at the same time, you, you couldn't help but have fear. He was scared. Sure he was. How is this going to play out? God's getting ready to do some marvelous, wonderful thing that he doesn't even understand yet, but he trusted the Lord, and he had faith, and, and the Lord reckoned to him as righteousness, right? I'm sure he was scared, but he wasn't going to let his fear divert him from being faithful. Now then, let's look at a, at a, at a let's contrast that with a passage, a long passage, and I'm going to summarize it, but it's a familiar story. David and Goliath. And the Israelites are arrayed in battle before the Philistines, right? And, uh, this is from 1 Samuel chapter 17. And here's the New York Yankees of the time. They send out Judge who is taunting Samson's taunting Israel. To be serious here, he's taunting Israel, making fun out of them, taunting them to send out a champion to fight him. And in verse uh, 11, it's uh, 10 and 11, and the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And we read a little farther along. They stayed. They did. They, nobody would go out there. And David starts wondering what's going on. And then we get to verse 24. Um, that, that says again about the men of Israel. When they saw the man, they fled from him and were much afraid. What were they scared of? What were they scared of? Dying. Dying, yes. This guy is going to kill us. He's going to defeat our champion and then they're going to overwhelm us and we're all going to die. God is no longer with us. God has left us. We are going to die. We don't believe God anymore. Their fear was diverting them from being faithful, was it not? <clears throat> what would you have? Would you have been afraid out there? Yes. So I'd have been quaking. Oh my gosh. And it's the same question that Abraham had to be. Do I believe God or not? It's scary. I don't know. But we allow experiences with new experience of suffering brings with it fear that have the power to alter our world and how we live our life. Fear does that. And we have to answer the question, what are we going to do with that fear? It's hard. I'm not, not saying, oh, well, we'll just roll our shoulders back and be brave. It's hard. Recognizing, maybe awareness is the answer. Again, we have to recognize that we are scared. We have to consider what has control of our worry, because we'll, we'll tend to worry. We become fearful in life, bills, responsibilities, work, illness, all these things pile in and we begin to worry. All right, there's a word. We begin to worry and focus on that, and ruminate on that, and chug and burn day and night in the middle of the night, and worry, worry, worry. That's the time to ask ourselves, what has control of our thoughts again. What is the focus on? Is the focus on what am I going to do about this fear? Or is my focus on this broken cistern over here? Or is my focus on Christ? And to use that, we may still be scared, but we have to turn our focus back to Christ. Then. I promise we'll stay scared. I'm sh we know Abraham was scared all the way up that mountain. Every step of the way he was scared. Uh, let's look a little more at fear. Uh, worry can stimulate fear. 
Proverbs 4.23 again. Who had that? I think Sam had it. Somebody read Proverbs 4.23 again? I want to appreciate more out of fear. Get more about fear. 420, Proverbs 4.23. What is flowing out of our heart? Is it worry? Is it fear? Let's recognize that. What is it controlling? What does it stimulate? What is this, what is this worry stimulating in us? Is it stimulating fear? Is it stimulating joy? I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm trying to put out the, the point. We need to notice what's going on with our heart. For fear is also spiritual warfare. It's warfare between fear and faith, doubt and hope, truth and, and lies. How many of our decisions in our life during times of uncertainty, during times of suffering, are made from fear? We are in the midst of suffering, we're in the midst of fear, and we make decisions hoping they'll just take it all away. And maybe we needed to ponder that a little longer. Uh, Consider Abram again in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, familiar, I'm going to summarize that, but Genesis 12, this is when, uh, I believe, when um, Abram and Sarah went to Egypt. And uh, Abram uh, went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but they will let you live. What was Abraham scared of? Dying and death, yes. What diverted him from, because he, earlier in that chapter, he had been called, what that fear diverted him from being faithful, did it not? He was worrying about it. He was probably staying up late at night worrying about it. Here, I've got a plan. And it involves Sarah. We don't need to get into that. But that was his plan and that was his answer. I come up with my plan sometimes, Sam. <laughs> Middle of the night. Maybe I need to ponder him a little longer. Maybe the fear is driving my decision and my thoughts more than I'm willing to write. Um, fear forgets. Psalm 136. Psalm, this is a great psalm. They're all great, of course. But Psalm 136. This is really, as I remember, a very uplifting psalm. Um, where did I want to get here? Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And as I, this psalm kind of elucidates, kind of enumerates all these blessings and all these good things that have happened. But fear causes us to forget all these things that have happened. Uh, it's never going to get better. How long is this going on? This has been going on a long time and fear causes us to forget where we've come from and what we've in, uh, endured with God's grace and what we've done with God's grace. Fear kind of blocks all that out. Right? The psalmist here elucidates and names all the great things that God has done. Right? Uh, to move on. Uh, fear becomes a lens and a guide. Uh, we pay too much attention to the fear. Uh, the Lord was scared, was He not? As He was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, was, do you imagine the Lord was fearful? He knew what He was about to do. That He was going to endure He's, he was going to have the, the wrath of God laid on him. The Lord, was, he, had a, he, he had a human body. He knew its frailties. He, knew, he felt pain. He, he knew sadness. Do you think he was scared in the garden as he was praying? But what did he pray? Not my will, but your will. In the midst of all that fear. I mean, he even said, if it's possible to take this cup away, but not my will, my will. Yeah. You know? Boy, that's a good lesson for us. In our fear. How long, I, Lord, I am scared of what you're asking. This pain, this suffering, this hurt, this despair, 
this thing I'm feeling, what the heck? Uh, but if we remember that fear defeats fear. Fear of God defeats fear of man. Fear of God, be in awe of God, and look to Him, looking up, Righteous fear, I don't know how to put that name differently, but fear of God will overcome our fear of man. Let's look at the envy trap. Psalm 73. Envy. Boy, I hope I, I was looking up examples of some of these. Ooh. What's that? <laughs> No, don't do this. Don't do it. Hold on, Sam. Pull back. Pull back. Put it in neutral. Um, Psalm 73, verse 20. <laughs> that narrowed it down a little bit for you, didn't it? <laughs> Would well, you give me that one? I believe that's the one I want. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when allows thou will despise their will. Aren't we wondering what Rick's going to make of this passage? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a dream there, doesn't it? Are dreams real? Are dreams real? We have them, but is the reality of the dream real? Yeah. And when we wake up, what happens? Just kind of vaporizes. You know, it might stick with you a little bit. What was that? You know? You know, our suffering can trap us into looking about and becoming envious, even angry about our circumstances. And it makes us question our allegiance to God. Let's see, uh, verse 13, of, uh, verse 13 of, of Psalm 73, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. All in vain. I've done all these good things. And it hasn't mattered a bit with you, Lord. We begin to question our allegiance. Envy becomes heavy and burdensome. Envy can, all, can also lead us to consider our circumstances as permanent. I am stuck in this. I'm always going to feel this way. Flair gets to go on with his life, and it's always great. And I just to make all, I imagine all these things, you know, and, and they're just vapor. These things I conjure up in my mind. None of it means anything. I become envious. I become bitter. I make something out of it that's not really there. I imagine God's against me, and it's really all just faith and stuff that exists between my ears. All this envy. Envy is pretty dangerous stuff. Envy makes us bitter. Job became bitter. To move along a little quickly here, uh, move along quickly here. Uh, Job chapter ten, verse one. If you were to read that, you see how Job became a little bitter. Envy uh, underestimates the goodness of God and forgets that we are eternal, and we spend too much time upon wishing for what once was or could have been or this is what I was hoping for and didn't get we become envious of all these dreams and things and the wouldas, the couldas, the shouldas and all that right? we become envious and like this passage says like when a dream when one awakes the Lord uh, it just all disappears like a famine and really nothing there the doubt trap let's look there uh, the doubt trap. I'm going to use, I think, Psalm 63 since we're nearby. Can I point something out about Psalm 73 just real quick? Would you please? So verse 28 says, it kind of concludes that, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Amen. So it's like the opposite. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. Psalm 63, 6. Let's see what I'm doing here. Uh, 
Um, begin in verse 5. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. And here the psalmist is, is focused on God and remembering God and the goodness of God, and he'll be satisfied. And sometimes don't we often forget to do that? I think this is related to an earlier trap. We, get, we are suffering, it's legitimate, it hurts, something's happened in our life. And we forget the goodness of God and we begin to doubt the very goodness of God. And in fact, Sam brought this up, the spiritual battle of Satan entering into it. What, what, is, uh, what, what to combat this doubt, we're taught to fight the devil's lies, James 4, verse 7. Somebody got that by memory? What's Satan doing? James 4, verse 7. Strong here to God, and doing so resist the devil, he will flee from him. Resisting the devil. James 4 7. We got Satan wants us to doubt God's goodness. He wants us to go back to these broken cisterns. He wants us to look inside our, our heart, which will fail us, instead of looking at Christ. So um, uh, we should count our blessings, which is what the psalmist did in Psalm 63, verse 6. We can confess our struggles. Uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, I've got a, I think I put a passage here to move along quickly. Uh, and look this up on, uh, when you go home. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. Uh, is What I, I'm using there is we should get busy when we're starting to doubt God and when we're caught up in our suffering instead of laying around and lamenting, even, even if it's physical pain, um, should get busy and do faithful things. I think Dottie's really great at that. Yeah. Instead of just focusing on your world, doing faithful things. Encourage others who are suffering. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. And allow your doubt to drive you to Christ. Take your doubt. And hate it and turn to Christ. Uh, I want to talk real quickly the denial trap I you know I had a hard time finding some scripture to support this because I'm just poor that way but I, I looked at Genesis 42 and the brothers of Joseph the brothers of Joseph had um, Joseph is now he's been elevated he's like the, the CEO of Egypt or something you know and uh, he's got the brothers in front of him and they are lamenting their situation uh, that because Joseph says, "Where's your? I want to see that brother. I want you to get him." You know, they're kind of in denial, not deep, not denial, really denial. He was waiting on that. That was good. How is he going to work that in? Whoa! <laughs> How is he going to work that? Everybody works that in. They were kind of in denial about the situation and what led to the situation they're in. Um, we often employ denial to keep us from recognizing this spiritual warfare that's really going on. This isn't, a, oftentimes we minimize what's going on. This isn't really a problem. I can get over this. My marriage is fine. I'm not abusing this. Um, my anger doesn't hurt anyone but me. It's all these different laments in denial of what's really going on in our life and that we got something else we, where there's a spiritual thing going on with our pain um, that needs to be dealt with. Is that clear? Denial. denial. There's a good example is when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he wanted eternal life and Jesus said, well, uh, follow the commandments and he gave him the commandments of and I've done all those things. All those things that happen to other people. Yeah. Pretty much so. This is one thing you lack. Yeah. Basically what he lacked was being willing to give up everything and follow Jesus. In other words, making God number one in his life. Yeah, it's interesting. He said, do all these things. He said, well, I've done all those things. Yeah. yeah. I'm, good. I'm good. I'm good. The complete denial. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Should call you up. Um, finally, the discouragement trap. Psalm 31, I'm going to go there. Psalm 31. Uh, beginning in verse 11, 12, and 13. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. 
I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. He's kind of lamenting to himself. He's very discouraging. Right? That's a very discouraging little passage here. He's kind of caught up in his own experience, and he's discouraged. There's a, there's a huge chunk. Bob's leading us to look at the Psalms and laments in, the, in, um, in, in, there, in, in the Psalms and our, in our sermons, laments of the Psalms. We can become discouraged to the point and ruminate on that and allow the discouragement to fester in our heart and take us away from looking up. And instead, we look down and, and employ things in our life, uh, creature comforts, other things in our life to overcome the discouragement. Those are all broken cisterns instead of looking up. Um, we begin to uh, discouragements when we allow our demeanor to become one of pointing out what is wrong or how I've been wrong or what you've done wrong or pointing our finger at God. That's the track. We begin pointing around at things, even ourselves, and allow ourselves to become discouraged instead of looking for encouragement. So that was quick. The traps of suffering. Next, you know, it's been rather dark, I think, these first three weeks of what is suffering, why suffering, and these traps of suffering will take a turn beginning of next week of looking at how we can overcome these things. And it begins with trusting God. Okay? Trusting Him who, for who He is because He's sovereign. He ordains the events of men. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, what's the word? Um, there's a, there's, there's a reason for everything. There's no, cons, there's, there's no, it's not consequences. What's the word when my command of the English language has left me? Uh, but, but there's a purpose. There's, there's a reason for.